a second. So good afternoon. Um, today we've got Tanya with us uh, from, well, I'll let her explain where she's from and say hello to you. So. Hello, it is actually afternoon there when we're recording and it is morning here. I am in San Antonio, Texas. My name is Tanya Campen. I am a, the Director of Intergenerational Discipleship for the Rio Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. And that's basically a grouping of United Methodist Churches in Texas that is overseen by one bishop. It's a lot of polity, but just to give you kind of an idea, I work alongside 382 churches doing the important work of faith formation. I have a PhD in Christian education and congregational studies, and I do a lot of research and work in the areas of children's spirituality and intergenerational discipleship. And I'm excited to be with you all today. Wow. So we brought some real brains in uh, so that John and I can, can uh, learn as well. So thank you for joining thank us. You. And actually, uh, we were talking earlier and Tanya was saying there are five conferences in the state of Texas. So um, it's a big place. So uh, thank you for making time to be with us. You're very welcome. So we, we've entitled tonight today's webinar about who, the who of intergenerational ministry. So who would you say intergenerational ministry is for? Hmm. That's a really important question. When I think about the who intergenerational ministry is for, I think of people of all ages, and I often use the language intergenerational ministry is ministry with people from birth to death. It's recognizing that each of us, no matter our age, have been called and equipped for doing the important work of loving God and neighbor. Um, one of my favorite scriptures that I use when I talk about intergenerational ministry and the who is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, verses 12 through 31, the language of, you know, there's one body and many gifts. And it's just important to note that the scripture reminds us that there are many parts of the body and that each part is important. And I like to say it doesn't matter how old each member of the body is, they all have an important role to play. So intergenerational ministry for me really is for all of God's children, recognizing that we all can contribute to strengthening the body um, so that we can then go out and do the work in the world that God has called us to. Um, with the just think a bit a bit more about that, um, I'm just interested. Do you think it's is largely in for in the church, or can it also mm. be for those on the out of church? If if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It it makes total sense. I think for me, it's both inside, like we say here, the walls of the church, like it's inside the walls, but it's also outside. It's recognizing that when we go out into the world, that the people that we meet all have um, gifts and experience and wisdom to share. And so it's more about partnership and joining with others than it is about you know, just going out and saying, and I see this a lot with um, older persons down to children saying, okay, I've got faith figured out, so let me give it to you. Um, intergenerational is more fluid and it's more connectional and it's more back and forth. So it's, let me join in this work with you. I'm gonna bring what I have, you're gonna bring what you have, and we're gonna learn together and God's gonna work in and through that. And so I think it's, the who is definitely people of all ages, but it's like you said, people in the church, people outside of the church, recognizing that um, we are all children of God. And the ideal is that we're all working together, doing the work that God has called us to. So um, I don't know if that 
answers mm -hmm. your question or help. Yeah, no, that is really helpful. I, I think sometimes we, so we kind of limit it to a bit on a Sunday morning when we used to be able to gather within the walls and hopefully we might be able to do that again at some point yeah. later this year maybe but but actually it, it can be seven days a week um whenever people can gather okay. so i think you've began to allude to this but i, I i'm also interested in uh, who do you who would you say benefits from um, being involved or participating in something intergenerational yeah, I think that's a really great and important question. I would say that we all do. We all benefit. Um, we bring what we have, where we're at, and we offer that into the work that God is doing in an intergenerational community. So um, if, for example, a child, one of my favorite stories is, I'm going to get out of my head for a minute and get into the practical and, and the experiential, but one of my favorite stories is when I had an intergenerational community gather for a meal you know, back in the day when we could gather in person and break bread together in person. And we had people sit in intergenerational communities at the table. So there were people of all ages and, and we provided them with a question at the table. And the question that this, um, this one specific table pulled or drew was, um, what are you afraid of? And at the table, there were, there was a three-year-old, there was a teenager, um, there were a couple 20, 30, when I say young adults, 20, 30s, and then there were a couple older, um, maybe in their 60s or 70s. So we definitely had all of the, gener a lot of the generations represented. And so when this question was asked, everybody kind of went around the table and shared, like, you know, things that they were afraid of. Um, and then the conversation turned to um, not just what we are afraid of, but what do you do when you're scared? Like what helps you, what calms that anxiety? And um, I remember watching the three-year-old just kind of sitting there quietly playing. I think he had Play-Doh or something in front of him. I don't know if y'all have Play-Doh, but, or clay. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> and then, uh, and he was just kind of working with it. And I was like, oh, I don't know if he's engaging at all. And he just looked up and he finally said, after everybody kind of got around the circle, he said, you know, I have really bad nightmares and sometimes I'm afraid to go to sleep. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I'm going to see what everybody does with this. And it was amazing to watch that intergen that, you know, small piece of the intergenerational community mm -hmm all of a sudden jump in and say, you know, well, when I'm afraid, this is what I do. Oh, well, that's a great idea. You know, when I'm afraid, I pray. When I'm afraid, I ask Jesus to come into my dreams. Um, all of these different ideas, and you could just see the three-year-old's face light up. And when I was watching the community around the table, I could see everybody else like really thinking and go and writing down and like, oh, that's a really great idea. So when you ask like who benefits, I think when it's when we're really together and we're really paying attention to each other, we all benefit. Mm -hmm. We can all learn from one another. Um, we one of the things I've learned in my ministry experience is we all have gifts that we bring to the table, and God gives us those gifts so that we can strengthen one another and we can learn from one another and we can teach one another. Um, I am grateful for those who are older than me, who mentor me and shepherd me and guide me because they not only have gifts, but they've had many years to shape and, and strengthen those gifts. And they have a lot of wisdom that they can now part and, and, and give me as I'm trying to struggle and figure out how to do this thing that is life. Um, and it's the same thing when I look at our kids, like I have a 14 month old and when I just get down on the floor with him and we wonder and we play together, it's amazing what I can learn, mm -hmm. um, what I see differently, what I experience differently. And so I think when we're paying attention, God moves in and through that intergenerational community so that we all benefit. We all learn, we all grow individually, but also collectively. Yeah, I, I know this. I want to. I love that story about the table. I think that's a really helpful. It's almost spontaneous when you create opportunity for spontaneous 
sharing, particularly intergenerationally, I think there's real that, that's when you really are building a community because I suspect that some of those adults would have come back to that child at some point and asked how he was doing or checked in with his parents and said, oh, I think that that's when we move from slightly from the theoretical and it becomes a real community building thing. Yeah, I certainly, yeah, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that somebody would have checked in on him and, and continued that relationship and that learning. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I think, um, so I guess some of that then is a, is a bit about creating culture that we feel that we can be involved in intergenerational ministry, like, can you can you think of um, a ways that we could try and build that culture? You know, is there one or two mm -hmm. thoughts you have about culture building within a congregation? Say um, about that we want to move into being deliver intentionally more intergenerational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and and I'll be honest and say that's the hard work, right? Um, I don't know in the UK, but I know in the United States, we've spent many years creating what we call siloed ministry or age level ministry, which of course has its purpose. We know that there's gifts and reasons to um, put people um, together in groups based on their age or based on their life experience. And so for me, it's a hybrid, it's a both and. And so when we think about intergenerational community, I always invite churches to start with by just paying attention and asking, where is this already happening naturally? Um, so that we're not, it's very few places that I've found that it doesn't exist at all and you actually have to create it from the bones, um, from the ground up. So I just, you know, paying attention. Um, an example is in my own church, we have, when we were, again, when we were in person, we had a fellowship hour in between, like we would have a service and then we would have a short fellowship, like third, I say hour, like 30 minutes. Um, and then we would have Sunday school um, time of learning. And then there'd be another service if people wanted to do that. And just in that 30 minutes, like one of my, and I miss it deeply, my favorite memories are just walking in and in this like fellowship hall or dining area, there's a table, you know, with snacks and, and if you just stand at the doorway, you can see people of all ages interacting with one another in different ways. And it's just this beautiful, natural, organic, intergenerational community. And so I always tell churches just to stop and to pay attention where that's already happening. Um, and to ask, how can we nurture this? How can we celebrate this? How can we strengthen this? Um, Oftentimes I've seen it um, breaking bread together or around the table, um, kind of like I described with just putting questions at a table and inviting conversation. I think now, of course, that most of us, at least I know most of our churches are still closed. Um, it's a little harder, um, but some of the things I've seen churches doing that I've really appreciated is as they've been creating online worship, they've asked, how do we include people of all ages? Um, you know, so you might, where some churches are recording just people my age as liturgists, you know, they've invited children to record reading scriptures or children saying prayers or teens, inviting teens um, into the process of liturgy, but also um, to help with the technology piece. Like, so just, you know, thinking bigger in terms of this is what we're creating. How is there space for people of all ages to participate? Um, I tell people I'm always the squeaky wheel in committee meetings because I'm always asking them, okay, okay, this is great, but these are the people you've asked to do something and they're all of the same generation. How do we expand that? Um, and I think that there's lots of opportunities to get creative and you just, you have to be willing to ask and to know the gifts of all of your people. Um, 
no matter their age. I don't know if that helps. It's yeah, no, it's tricky because it, it seems cult is the we somehow creating the culture that is asking that important question, which is you know like who who are we aiming for and why is there only one group? Is there a way that we can expand that group of who are participating, leading? So no, Absolutely. that's really cool. And and the final kind of question really is. I, and again, I think we've been touching on this, but is it who helps deliver the intergenerational ministry? Mm -hmm. Who, who, you know, is there? I suspect I know the answer, but yeah, who, <laughs> who helps deliver it? I think it's a great question, and I think church leadership um, is essential in, like you said, shift in helping make this cultural shift. Um, it doesn't matter how old we are. We're not going to participate if somebody doesn't see us and doesn't invite us. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I feel that is, I'll just say as a 40 year old woman, I feel that like, sometimes I don't feel seen. Sometimes I don't feel invited just as, you know, you can watch a three-year-old in a room, like looking up at all of these big people, just feeling like, I, I don't know why I'm here. It's just a bunch of adults talking to one another. So I think it takes intentionality on the church leadership to name, we're going to do this important work of seeing people, no matter their age, of building relationships with people so that we know what their gifts are. Um, and then of asking those intentional questions as we plan strategic ministry, who is at the table, who is missing from the table. Um, I ask that of my youth ministry council all of the time. Like, who is missing? Who do you want to invite? Who do we need to hear from? I, I feel like our most vulnerable are often the ones that aren't seen as much, our children, our teens, um, our older adults. So paying attention to that. And I think that comes to the church leadership of taking a holistic view of their community and the ministry God's called them to. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's yeah, some really great wisdom in there. Um, who's at the table and who's not? That's that we often can see the people at the table, but we don't often think about who isn't at the table. So I think that's a really great um, picture for us to kind of ponder and think about. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yeah, I think for now, if that's all right, we'll we'll um, thank you for your time and your wisdom mm -hmm. and sharing with us. And we, we might even be here in person actually on the day. So we'll see what happens because it'd be very early in Texas morning. So we'll see. So for now, if I say thank you and uh, goodbye, and then yes, we'll see you at some point. That sounds good. Thank you so much, Tiz. This has been a pleasure. <laughs>